Hi. So my name is Lauren Voswinkel. I work for Living Social, uh, and yes, that is still a company. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm here to talk about service-oriented architecture, um, and um, service-oriented architecture. Uh, what is a service? Many people know like the general idea of what a service is, but when I went looking for what it actually should be according to Wikipedia, they told me it was an unassociated, loosely coupled, self-contained unit of functionality. That's a lot of words, in my opinion, for a singularly focused application. Um, so what are the benefits of a service-oriented architecture or pulling out a service from a Rails application? Um, one of the benefits is that many things can be made asynchronous. You can basically fire and forget a uh, a request and have it run in the background and then have the, have the report generated or what have you and sent off via email in the background. Um, it is parallelizable, meaning that it is possible that if you are pulling a list of users or various information to make multiple requests at the same time to the same service and have them get back without needing to wait for multiple round trips. It is, like it said, loosely coupled, meaning that you don't need to worry so much about a change in your service breaking something else that is unrelated to what your change was. Uh, this also leads to faster tests. And what I mean by faster tests is that the test suite gets broken up into multiple pieces that can be run individually so that when you make a change to one part of your, of your architecture, you only need to run the tests for that service. So it can break up a 30-minute test suite into multiple five-minute test suites. Um, it's also easier to extend and change because of that loose coupling. You, again, don't need to worry about having a change that you make in one service drastically affecting a change in another service. And uh, finally, it yields an increased velocity because of that quick response time, because you don't have to worry about, um, about making changes that break something else. So I had always heard about this and wondered how. How do you actually build the service? I had tried numerous times to pull out services from existing applications, and I felt a lot like this. A dog with shoes on. It was a lot of stumbling and just kind of fumbling around trying to figure out what was going on. Um, so like I said, I work at Living Social. Um, and at Living Social, we have so many services. There are 50 plus services for various things, things like um, having people log in, things like payment, like payment information, uh, merchant, uh, giving merchant information about how their deal is doing, and this is all broken up into multiple pieces. So when I was working there, uh, I work on the finance team, and we had decided that we needed a more accurate, up-to-date uh, payment information service so that we could update our payment and billing process um, and also give the merchants more up-to-date information. And so we decided to build a new API or a new version of the API, which meant that we could basically do what we wanted to do. So we decided to dog food our own client. Or, or, so basically, that meant we were going to pull out our API and have our own client, that is what the team, the payment team used, actually use the same API so that we didn't have functionality in our, in our uh, client that didn't exist over the API. So let's get started about talking how did we actually pull out this service. Um, and how do we separate the client from the, from the service. So when building a service, you need to determine what the service will actually do. Services should do one thing well. They should really just be focused on, say, providing session information 
or providing customer billing informa customer information, billing information, things like that. And they should really have one particular focus. Now, within that, you can have multiple endpoints. And that brings us to the second part, which is figuring out and creating what those endpoints are. Um, so when thinking about pulling out a session service, you should be thinking, OK, there is the ability to create a new session when somebody logs in. There's the ability to check whether that session is currently active to make sure that the person is still logged in. And there's the ability to destroy a session. So those are basically what your endpoints are going to be. Um, so then you build the controllers with those endpoints in mind, opening them up to the, API, to the API to make various requests or to receive various requests. Um, when you're determining those, uh, when you're building those, you need to determine what options are available in those uh, requests. What I mean by that is maybe you have filters for the response. Say, um, say you've got numerous pieces of information for a customer, uh, like their home address, their social security number, their um, credit card information. When you make a request to this particular service, you want to be able to select what those pieces, what pieces you actually show. Um, another thing that could be, another thing that could be used is uh, you can get potentially multiple uh, objects per request. So when you're asking for users, you can get ten different users based on various IDs with one request. That makes it so that you don't need to worry so much about making parallel requests. So when we at Living Social were creating these uh, various controllers and modeling everything, we ended up going with a gem called Active Model Serializers. Um, Active Model Serializers is a great way to control what, is, what you're actually able to get out of a service by default. Yes, you can do that by re like overwriting the to JSON method in your actual model, but there's a problem with that in the sense that adding another filter on top of that might actually undo those defaults if it's not coded well. So what Active Model Serializers does is actually pulls out what is available from that API at all times. And it's really easy to use and understand. Basically, you just have a list of attributes and maybe a list of associations. So in this, um, and it, like, it segregates all of that information and makes it really simple to figure out what is exposed in your API so that if you have something like social security information on a user, you can ensure that that never gets exposed through your API. So the other big thing when you're writing the controllers and writing the, this API basically is you need to write tests. It is imperative that you write tests because what these tests actually do is they are a contract of what your service actually fulfills. They tell you that yes, you are actually able to get X, Y, and Z information. Sorry, that should be Z for you guys. <laughs> um, so. It basically says that, yes, I am providing this information. So after you do that, you need to create the client models. How does, how does somebody using your service actually um, parse the response that you're, get, that you're giving them? Don't use the plain responses. It is a terrible, terrible idea to just take a JSON hash or what have you and just use that. It gets really hairy very quickly. Um, what I ended up doing for, for rapid prototyping was something really kind of hilariously heinous. Um, this is a lot of metaprogramming that basically will take a JSON hash and then check to see, okay, is the, is the value of this key a hash? Okay, try to create an object from that. If the object doesn't exist, it goes out and just assigns that, uh, it creates a method that assigns that value to uh, the return value for that uh, method. If it does exist, it creates a model 
that then gets returned as that value. Uh, if it's an array, it tries to build multiple objects that get, um, that get associated in that array at like an association, basically. Um, and if it's anything else, it just gets added as a method that returns the, the plain value. So it actually led to a lot of basically empty classes that just defined that, yes, this is actually an object that we care about. Um, but then it also gave me the ability to define particular behaviors on the different methods. Like this one allowed me to specifically call out and make uh, payment, actual payment and expected payment uh, arrays. Again, this is really, really great for rapid prototyping and allowed me to build and extend everything very, very quickly, but it is horrible, absolutely horrible for everything else. The main reason why it's really terrible is because there's no concreteness to it. And so uh, the next step is basically just write tests from the client side. What those tests on the client side is, is proof that your service hasn't changed, that it is still providing an expected response. So the next step is building a communication layer. How, do, how does your service talk to clients using it? Find a gem. There's a lot of gems out there. HTTP party, uh, Typhus, uh, Faraday, all sorts of different things wrap around the standard net HTTP library which is also perfectly fine to use if you want to feel like a hacker and make random janky code. Um, I suggest using Typhus. Uh, the reason why I suggest using Typhus is it has built-in support for concurrent requests. It uses libcurl to make requests via curl and then send those responses back through the gem. So basically, you can, out of the box, queue up 10 different requests and then have them all run at the same time so you don't have to worry about multiple round trips over the network. Wrap the gem when you're using it. Don't just use the gem, like the gem straight up API. The reason why I really, really heavily suggest this is because a lot of people here probably experienced one particular gem's pain going from version 2.3 to 3.0. That would be active record. Um, when you just use a gems straight, like straight from the box, it usually has an API that remains pretty standard, but then when a new version comes out, it can drastically change. So when you're wrapping the gem and creating your own uh, set of calls to it, that provides one place in your code base that you actively need to change. So there's a bonus step that if you take the client models and the communication layer and you add them together, you get a gem. Was this, was this a thing in Australia? <laughs> okay. I actually mean a, a ruby gem, not gem in the holograms. Um, so one of the, the next step after you create your gem to be kind to all of your client users, um, is to sever dependencies. You're basically going to replace any direct database calls with a call to the service. You're going to be creating a gap between the application that currently exists and the server that it's going to be relying upon. This is pulling out a service from, a, from an existing application. So this is the step where you start creating that separation between, those, uh, between the two applications. It's really important to mind that gap. Um, you need to ensure that that gap is being created so that when you actually do the extraction, there's no pain involved. One of the biggest problems that I had when originally doing uh, this service extraction was I had spent multiple hours trying to figure out why all of my requests were timing out. Every request that I was making to the service would wait the 5, 10, 30 seconds, whatever was set for, the, for that, and would just end up timing out. And it turns out what I had run into was a web brick wall. 
Webrick would basically wait, would, would receive the request, and would then have another request queued up behind it that it would, the first request would be waiting on, so then it would time out, resolve that request, pick up the other one, and finish it like immediately. So if you have a server, it needs to be able to handle multiple, multiple, multiple requests in this step to ensure that you actually get something useful rather than just timing out. So next part is improving the performance of your service. A round trip will always take more time than a database call. One of the tools that I suggest incredibly heavily, because you really should use tools when you're doing any type of performance profiling, is either StackProf if you're using Ruby 2.1 or higher, or Perf Tools, which is basically StackProf for all of us schlubs that don't actually have the joys of working in Ruby 2.1. Um, Perf Tools, when you first use it, is really, really scary. This is the, um, this is the text view for a, uh, a request in Rails. And it's really kind of terrifying. Uh, one of the most terrifying things is that top line that actually says that the garbage collection took some odd 67% of the time for the request. We made a lot of objects. Uh, it's kind of terrible. Um, so what ends up, the way to read this is you've got on the far left the number of times that this, that that line method shows up in the stack. Um, as the currently executing piece of code. And then there's the percentage directly next to it, and then the total percentage that, that has happened with that line and every line before it. So it's a running total. Um, I completely ignore those for the most part. Uh, I pay attention to the numbers on the fourth column and fifth column, really the fifth column almost exclusively, which is representative of what percentage of time is being spent in that call and any call that it makes. So it's all of its descendant calls. So when you look at something that says that it takes up 33.3% of time in that, um, in that request, that is for when it is the active member in the stack or when it is in the stack at all. And that's really useful. So, when digging in, it's important to know where exactly you are entering into, uh, where exactly you're entering into your um, application. In this case, using Active Model Serializers, our requests were almost immediately being picked up by the as JSON or to JSON methods. Um, if you look on the second line, that is 35.7% of, of the time of the request, which actually is exactly um, the complement to the 64.3% that the garbage collector was taking. So, um, so the entire time of the request that we had direct control over was that 35.7%. So then digging down further, um, the next part was looking at like the deal serializer, which Fast attributes basically is what, how long it takes to compile that list of attributes in active model serializers. And then you go through and you look at it and says, oh, gross sales is 5.9% of that. So basically 8.0% um, is fast attributes as, as a whole. 5.9% is gross sales by itself, which means that roughly 2.1% is for everything else in fast attributes. So this kind of helps you zero in on things. So I then dug in, looked at gross sales, and eventually found coupon, our coupon calculator, which the coupons method took 21.5% of time. So that's like 10% less than the total time that it took to run the request. So this is basically the method that I needed to focus all of my time on, because that was taking two-thirds of the entire time to process everything. Turns out it was also a big part of creating all of those objects that then the garbage collector would take time as well. Um, so that's a rough overview of perf tools and how to drill down into things. 
Uh, the last thing that you need to do is to actually transfer the client or service and pull it out from the application that you were, that you were working with. So you need to extract the tables and, the, or, and or the database that's involved in that, pull it out into a separate instance so that it is not working on the same instance as everything else because that leads to terrible things. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of living socials code actually shares the database and it gets really, really confusing and difficult to deal with because another application will make a change to the data that you're looking at and you have to wait for that application to actually make the changes and it's really confusing to try to figure out when did that change actually happen. Um, so try to extract the tables and database um, for any service that you build. Uh, and then you need to actually make the extraction from the, the code base perspective. Just pulling out all of the controllers that you built, pulling out the, the models that you built, pulling out the, the client that you built, make, the, make that separation uh, as complete as possible. Build it into a gem, build it into another Git repository, whatever. Make it its own separate thing that has its own work. This also includes pulling out all the tests and everything for that particular, uh, for that particular service. And that's it. Thanks.